my brother in Christ. You might not know me, but I know you. I've attended some of your classes. While I do agree with most of what you teach, one particular subject I don't agree with. My brother, we must be careful of what we teach because it can lead our fellow believers away from the truth. There is no easy way to say this. I believe you might be teaching false doctrine. We know that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. We are not in disagreement there, but the keeping of the Sabbath holy was an Old Testament command. This is a command that we no longer need to keep. What is so interesting is that man, Adam and Eve, they were created at the end of the sixth day, which in the Bible is called the preparation day, which we call today Friday. So as they were made toward the end of the sixth day, then their first full day would be the day of rest. It is true, God doesn't get tired. Isaiah 40, 28 says it doesn't weary, get tired. But it also says over and over in the Bible that we should, he's our supreme example. And so I believe that's exactly what it was for. It was to be an example. The Bible in Mark chapter two says that the, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So Mark 2 and verse 27 says that the Sabbath was made for man, not the Jew. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So if man was created on that sixth day before the seventh day Sabbath was established, and then immediately after the sixth day and after God made man, God made the seventh day Sabbath specifically for man, then we can only conclude that God made the seventh day Sabbath with Adam and Eve in mind and that both Adam and Eve also rested on that first Sabbath day because it was specifically made for them, for man. I primarily believe that the reason why Jesus, him, obviously it was Jesus here doing the creating, it was Jesus doing the resting. Uh, Jesus rested here because obviously he was showing forth an example for Adam and Eve whom he just created, remember, on the sixth day of the week. From the very beginning, when you look at creation, you do see God creating and he's speaking things into existence. He's saying, let there be light, and boom, there's light. Let there be a firmament, boom, there's a firmament. And then when it comes time to make man, he obviously got personal. He formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And now there comes a time for a relationship, right? He's made everything, he's created everything. Now he's created the grand design. He's created humanity. And now it's time for a relationship to be established, which now brings apart the seventh day of the week. What joy must have been in the heart of, of, of God to that he couldn't wait to interact, to be with his creation, specifically Adam and Eve in the beginning, that, that there was no way that he could go another day without it. And, and immediately after creation, he understood that it, it was to be so. Not only did he need to lay the ground uh, for, for, for what was to be their life in the Garden of Eden, but precisely 
that he wanted to spend time with the creation, with the, with the people that he already loved so much after creation. He also wanted to reveal himself to the newly formed couple in Adam and Eve, and of course to the rest of humanity. But to do that, you need time to do that. And so the Sabbath is designed to have a time specified or set apart just for that reason, to spend time together. If we can just imagine, you know, Adam and Eve, they've been created, and the sixth day is, is coming to a close, and they're looking out over the whole garden and how beautiful it is. It's a perfect paradise. And they're looking here, and it's the first thing that they've really got to comprehend other than God himself. And now they're seeing this beautiful garden. And they look around and they hear this rustling in the grass, and there's Christ. Christ came to spend this first day. Now this would be their first full day of life. He came to spend this day with them. I imagine that he walked them through the creation and showed them step by step everything that he had created because the man and woman were created on the last day. So he was showing them everything he had created up until that point. I truly imagine that he just took them through a tour of his creation so that they would know without a doubt that he was a benevolent, creative God. And so the Sabbath is, this, the seventh day is that relationship time now that God is gonna spend with his creation. And he's really going to be able to just share with them who he is, who they are, and all the details that's necessary to build that relationship. And so the Sabbath is, is ultimately for that. Jesus rested in a sense to enjoy his creation. God rested on the seventh day because he wanted to spend the first full day with the humans. And now, humans, they didn't do any work. The first thing that they did, the other men need, they spent the whole full 24 hours with God and they were resting. And that would have been an awesome thing to see as they were resting there on that seventh day with, uh, with God, God communing with them, talking with them. And so God, it's not like God, you know, created that cow and said, ooh, you know, it took it out of me. I'm tired, I need to rest. Uh, God doesn't uh, get tired in that sense, but certainly was resting uh, spiritually. He was resting physically to show forth an example of how we are to rest each and every week on the seventh day Sabbath. You see, if God didn't spend that set time with Adam and Eve, they wouldn't know what to do. God set forth this example so that Adam and Eve would have order in their lives. And most importantly, the Sabbath was there for God and his creation to enjoy each other's company. Much like how a father and mother, after delivering a baby, the, that first day with the baby is spent enjoying what they had just created. The Sabbath was for a specific group of people and for a specific time. We know this because there is no evidence that even Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, nor Jacob kept the Sabbath. Sabbath keeping was only instituted after Egypt on Mount Sinai, and that's way after Jacob's time. So a lot of people have this idea that the Ten Commandments only came at Mount Sinai and that no one before Mount Sinai had to keep the law or that there ever was a law, and especially a Sabbath law. A lot of people, they would say, God never gave no commandments. God never gave 10 commandments to Abraham, to Enoch, or to all the others who lived during that time, or to Jacob. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. Speaking about Noah, he was perfect and righteous, and he walked with God. And that word walk is interesting because it means that they, they, they literally walk with God. They behave like God. Then we go to verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When we have in the Bible this phrase, walk with God, that means that they were doing everything what God verbally told them to do. They were so connected with God that everything they did it with God. Now the Bible says in 1 John 4 and verse 8 that God is love. Love is who God is. And Romans 13 and verse 10 tells us that love is the fulfilling of the law. So if God is love and love fulfills the law, then God's very character is the law. 
the Ten Commandments. Now the Bible says in Amos 3 in verse 3 that two cannot walk together except they agree. So it would really be silly for Enoch and Noah to walk with God and not agree with his Ten Commandments, the very being and character of God. Since the Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments, we can't disconnect it from the other nine as much as they try to. So if the Sabbath didn't exist from creation until Sinai, then none of the other nine did. But the reality is that we could find all 10, including the Sabbath, in Genesis and Exodus prior to the giving of the law at Sinai. So if we go to Exodus chapter 16, it's powerful to see that in Exodus 16, we see the children of Israel, they're out there whining and complaining because they're hungry. And, 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 and you know, oh, you know we, when we were in Egypt, we had all this food, but now we're out here and God's brought us out here to starve. And so they basically start whining and complaining. And God sends a message to Moses and he says, look, uh, I'm going to feed my people, but first I'm going to test them. And then God says, I want to see if they're going to follow my commandments or not. Well, what commandments were they following? We see that four chapters before in Exodus 16, God is saying, on the seventh day, I'm not going to rain any manna from heaven because they are to rest on that day and they are to gather a double portion on the sixth day to prepare them for the Sabbath rest that I'm going to give them. Well, wait a minute now. Keep in mind, this is Exodus 16. How is it that the idea of the Sabbath was already there? Obviously, before the Sabbath was given on Mount Sinai at Exodus 20. That's because the Sabbath had been established from the seventh day of creation and it had been recurring weekly ever since. Another clear example of the Sabbath before Sinai is found in Exodus 5, 5, where it reads, And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them to rest from their burdens. And ye make them rest from their burdens. The key word is rest. So now this was right after Moses fled into the wilderness for 40 years and then came back because God commanded him to go back to free the Israelites. The first thing God had Moses do was to reinstitute the Sabbath rest for the people of Israel because they were working too much. How do we know that that word rest is, represent, is, a, is referring to the Sabbath? Well, if you look it up in the original Hebrew, that word is Shabbat, which means Sabbath. The Pharaoh knew that the Sabbath was a day of rest. In some kind of way, perhaps they had other beliefs about God, but definitely everybody understood that Sabbath specifically meant rest. This goes all the way back to even the time of Abraham in the book of Genesis, where it actually says that, it, you know, Abraham kept my commandments. Chapter 26 and verse five, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes, and my laws. Genesis chapter 39, it mentions there that Potiphar's wife makes a move on, on Joseph and she invites him to lie with me. And his response is telling, it says, how then should I commit this grave sin against God? And as we know, sin is the transgression of the law. Now, if the law didn't exist, then Abraham would have had nothing to keep and, and there would have been nothing here for Joseph to realize that this was a sin. When we go to Genesis chapter four, we see that the king killed his brother. Why would God charge him if he explicitly didn't give him this commandment that you should not kill? Of course, if there was no law at that time that they needed to follow, why would God come and question Cain about it? the fact that he had just killed his brother. God came looking for him and said, what is this thing that you have done? It says there that Cain slew his brother. And so the, the laws have already been there from the very inception, from the very beginning, including the Sabbath. And when you look at Genesis, the story of, of Noah, where God looks upon the earth and, and realizes that the whole world, there is nothing but evil in their hearts of all men except for one man. So even though the text does not explicitly say right there in Genesis 6, 7, 8, or 9 during that story or that flood story of Noah, we know that the people were evil in their hearts. Their thoughts were evil continually, according to the first few verses of Genesis 6. They were living a life contrary to God's holy law. And so I believe that up to that point, there was probably a large, vast majority of the population at that time that simply were not only not keeping the Sabbath holy, 
not only not honoring God as creator of the universe, but they were also, you know, lying and they were killing, they were murderous in their hearts, they were an adulterous generation. These were evil, evil people. And it, even it was so bad that the scripture says in Genesis 6 that God, it grieved him in his heart that he had even created them. And so out of that comes the story of Noah. The Bible specifically says that he found grace in God. What is it that we need grace for? Sin. And so if we need grace because of sin, and if there was no law at the time of Noah, why would Noah need grace if there is no law that would convict him of sin? It was by faith that Noah and his family entered the ark. And so I believe that faith was based on a relationship that they had with God and a love that they had for God to obey him and all the commandments that he had given them. So after the flood, if we can remember, in Genesis 11, the Bible says that the whole world was of one language and of one speech. In the beginning, we were all of one tongue, but because of the sin of man shortly after the flood, God confounded their language, and this was how different languages came about. Now, if we look at all the root languages, all the root languages of the different dialects of the world, the word Sabbath is still being used for Saturday. Why is that? Shabbat in Hebrew, Sabet in Arabic, Subota in, in most European languages. In the vast majority of today's tongues, language groups, you find that the word Sabbath, Shabbat, is still used as the seventh day. Not only is it that they all have a seven day uh, week, but on top of that, the vast majority of them still use the word Shabbat to signify the seventh day. In Hebrew, it's done that way. In Portuguese, it's done that way. And even in my native Spanish, Sabado, everybody knows that's Saturday. That's the seventh day of the week. And what does Sabado mean? It means to rest. It comes from the Hebrew word Sabbath. Remember, the languages were confounded before Exodus. And it's very clear that before Exodus, they had a knowledge of Sabbath. In fact, they even, st they even still called it Sabbath when the languages were confounded. They still called it the rest day, Sabbath. Another clear indication that there was a law and that there were laws that needed to be kept prior before Mount Sinai is, it is in the story of Lucifer. Lucifer in heaven, remember, before there ever was an Adam, before there ever was an Eve, before there ever was an earth, it says that he actually fell from God's grace in the sense that he was a covering cherub and he was perfect in all his ways. This is Ezekiel chapter 28, by the way. He was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. Well, what's iniquity? Now that word iniquity means lawlessness. It is the transgression of the law, which is sin. So sin or lawlessness was found in Lucifer in heaven before even the creation of Adam and Eve. And if that is so, then that means the law was in heaven before it was even on earth. And so if Lucifer brought iniquity in heaven, then that must mean there was a law that had to have been broken in heaven way prior before Adam and Eve even had been created. And so we know very clearly that when the law, if the law was in heaven during Lucifer's time, God for sure would have shared his law, his commandments uh, to his people, even before he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai. My brother, the Bible says in Exodus 31 and Ezekiel 20 that the Sabbath was only to be a sign between God and Israel, not Gentiles. Therefore, Gentiles don't have to keep the Sabbath. Now when we come really when the written law was given, which is in Exodus chapter 20, I'm just going to read the Four Commandment, which it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
Who were to be those strangers if not Gentiles at that point? Now let's notice Exodus 12 verses 37 and 38. This was when Moses, after finally convincing the Pharaoh to let God's people go, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. A mixed multitude also went with them out of the land of Egypt. A mixed multitude meaning they were not Jews. They were foreigners or strangers, which means Gentiles. So then the stranger that the fourth commandment was talking about were the Gentiles that came out of Egypt with them. And of course, any other stranger that came their way. So it was very, very clear here that if there was any stranger or any Gentile, stranger could be a Gentile at that time, that those people were also keeping the Sabbath. If they accepted Jehovah as their, as their God and they gave up their pagan ways, no doubt. No doubt, that's found in the fourth commandment, that the Sabbath was also given for the stranger within my gates. So the Sabbath wasn't just made for the Jews, as a lot of Christians falsely claim. There, nowhere in the scripture will you find it called the, the, the Sabbath of the Jews. It's always called the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But let's go also even further, before the Ten Commandments were given. If we talk about Abraham, when we come to Genesis chapter 26, and we see about the Abraham, and it says here in verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So it was very, very clearly that Abraham kept the laws and the statutes of God. So even though it does not explicitly say that Abraham kept the Sabbath, we know that the Sabbath is part of God's commandments. And the Bible says Abraham kept the commandments of God, meaning he kept the Sabbath as well. If you know the history of Israel, Israel was actually going through, after being set free from bondage in, in, in Egypt, they were to be the gospel tears to reach the other nations, the hostile nations that had taken over the promised land. And so they were to be the gospel light, the light that was going to share the true God with all of these pagan empires. It even says there, Isaiah 42 and verse six, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. And so the Jews were supposed to be the light for the Gentiles to bring them back to God. The problem with Israel was that they were actually, instead of them converting those hostile empires, those hostile empires converted them. And so there was a lacking of that in scripture. You don't see a whole lot of scripture talking about them witnessing to the hostile empires as much as you see the hostile empires rubbing off on them. But nevertheless, that was God's plan from the beginning for them to take that message of who he is, his character of his law to the rest of the nations. Gentiles are those who are non-Jewish people. So the idea is that because they're not Jews, then they don't have to keep the Sabbath or God didn't expect uh, non-Jews to keep the Sabbath holy and that there's no evidence of the Old Testament. Well, I would say that there is uh, because if you go to Isaiah chapter 56, God is specifying that not only did he expect the Jewish people to keep the Sabbath during this time, but he also opens the door for the Sabbath to be a blessing to the stranger, the foreigner. This is the language he uses. So now God is inviting the foreigners or the Gentiles to join in with his people and look at the beautiful promise he makes to them. Verse six, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from, notice, defiling the Sabbath. So right here, he's declaring a blessing upon anyone. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take it hold of my covenant. So the covenant isn't meant to just be with just one specific people. God is inviting all of humanity to be part of his people. Verse seven finishes saying this, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. They are burned offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Very, very clearly. It is not, the Sabbath was not only for the Jews. So the Sabbath was meant not just for the Jews, it was meant for every person. The Sabbath was kept also by the Gentiles who wanted to accept God 
and he swells. And actually this goes in harmony with what we see Jesus saying in Mark chapter 2 verse 27 when he says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It's for everyone there and that's what we're seeing there in Isaiah 56. There were many people in the Old Testament who were not Jews who would have come out of Egypt with the children of Israel who did uh, basically partake in that blessing of Sabbath keeping. Now wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say in Exodus 31 and Ezekiel 20 that the Sabbath was, uh, was to only be a sign between God and the Israelites and the Jews? If you look at Romans 2, Paul is talking about those who are circumcised, who are the Jews or the Israelites. And then he says, if you are a Jew and you are circumcised and if you keep the law, good for you. But if you are a circumcised Jew or Israelite and you break the law, then you are no longer considered circumcised. You are no longer a Jew. That's interesting. Now watch what he says in the next verse. Paul says, If the uncircumcised Gentile keep the righteousness of the law, he is circumcised. He is a Jew. How? How can we explain this? If you skip on over to verses 28 and 29, Paul says this. He says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, so, so you're not a Jew in your, in your appearance, in your skin color, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Paul is saying, you are not a Jew by your outward appearance. You are a Jew if you keep the righteousness of the law or the commandments of God. And that's why he says even Gentiles are Jews if they keep the commandments of God. You can only be part of God's true people if you uphold the Ten Commandments. And if the Gentiles are upholding the Ten Commandments, they are no longer Gentiles. They are spiritual Jews spiritual Israelites. And if you are a spiritual Israelite, the sign between God and His true faithful people is the Sabbath. That also means then, being a physical Jew means nothing if you are not being a spiritual Jew. In order for anyone to tell who is part of God's true people, you must examine if they have the sign, which is the observance of the Sabbath. We're all Jews. Anybody who accepts Christ, anybody who's a Christian, we are grafted in. And those who are of our literal Jews, you know, DNA, you know, heritage-wise Jews, if they reject Christ, they're cast out. In the eyes of God, they're no longer Jews. It's those who, who claim and accept Christ as their Messiah, that is new Israel. And it includes actual Jews, you know but they have to accept Christ. Romans chapter 10 in the New Testament, there is a new principle that is established that God was really trying to break down this, this um, antagonistic racism that the Jews had accompanied in, along their years. And in Romans 10, beginning in verse 12, notice what the Word of God says here, very clear. He says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, that would mean the Jew and the Gentile. It says, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So we have to understand that if there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, why are we trying to make a difference between the Jew and the Gentile? Jesus himself sat with the Samaritans. They laughed him to scorn because he, he, he looked like some great apostate. But this was a man who's trying to break down these religious and, and racial barriers so that we can come together in unity and in the same belief, worshiping the same God.